Welcome to another edition of 7 and 7, where we'll explore this week's Torah portion of 7 readings in just about 7 minutes. This week's Torah portion is Parshat Vayera, and that refers to Abraham seeing God uh, after his circumcision, when he's sitting outside his tent. Uh, you may know the story that Abraham receives a visit from God. God wants to uh, visit the ill. Uh, and as Abraham's starting his conversation with God, he sees three uh, guests, or what appear to be guests, and in fact are angels uh, in human disguise. And he invites them in, and they uh, participate in a meal with Abraham and with Sarah. And one of the angels informs Sarah that they will be having a child. And Sarah, who's 89 years old, and of course uh, thinks herself being unable to be able to have a child, laughs inside and this upsets God because it seems to show a lack of faith in God's capabilities. If you read the story closely, it turns out that Abraham was having a conversation with God and then suddenly he stopped that conversation in order to go talk to uh, three strangers who were passerbys. And the Talmud teaches a powerful lesson that from here we can see that it's greater to invite guests into your home than it is to receive the Shekhinah, to receive the Divine Spirit, which is what Abraham was doing. That's an incredible idea. The second reading tells us that the angels leave uh, and Abraham escorts them on their way. Two of the angels are on this journey. One's job is to destroy the city of Sodom and Amor, and the other one is to save Abraham's nephew, Lot. God says that he has to inform Abraham of what he's about to do to the Sodom and the five uh, cities in that region. And he tells Abraham that I have to tell you this because you are this is going to be your land and these are uh, your people and you should follow in God's ways. And then Abraham starts what's become a very famous negotiation with God and he asks God if there are 50 righteous people among those five cities, will you save them if there are 45, 40, then 30, then 20, then 10? And it turns out that there isn't even that and so Abraham leaves. An interesting idea is the sages explain on a different verse that says that you should try to follow God's ways. And the sages ask, how can a human being follow in a great godly God's ways? And they point to this verse that says we should do uh, righteous and justice just, just as God does. And they give a few examples, just as God visits the sick. Uh, in the case of Abraham, we can emulate God in that way. Just as God visits uh, the mourners, we can do that too. And they bring a verse that shows that, that God visited Isaac after the passing of his mother, um, etc. So it turns out that this idea of doing justice and, and Righteousness is actually tzedakah and justice, or in the phrase of the Torah, uh, is actually the way that can help us walk uh, in the ways of God and to be emulating the behavior of God. The third reading continues with the story of uh, Sodom and Amora. The angels arrive at Sodom and they approach the home of Lot, uh, who invites them in and offers them some food. And the people of uh, Sodom who hear about this and they're famous for their inhospitality and their inability to share and to give to others. Uh, although the Torah doesn't make clear what their sin is, uh, but it's certainly a, a city worthy of destruction. And they invite, uh, Lot invites the angels in and they tell him their mission to destroy the city of Sodom. And they tell him to bring his daughters and his wife and to invite his married daughters and two son-in-laws. Uh, those two couples, the two married daughters and son-in-laws reject the offer. And so the people, the, the angels tell Lot and his daughters that they will uh, flee the city of Sodom before the, the people of Sodom are able to lay their hands on these guests who are these two angels and they're told that as they're fleeing they need to only look forward they're not allowed to look backwards at the destruction of the city of, Sa of Saddam. An interesting idea that's uh, that takes place here is that as I mentioned this, the, the sin of Sodom and Amora is not clear uh, but the Mishnah tells us that one who says what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours is of the character trait of Saddam. Uh, and perhaps the idea here is that when someone says, I won't touch your stuff, but don't you dare touch what's mine, uh, means that they have the inability to really give at all. Um, and so perhaps that might sound fair that what's mine is mine and what's yours is yours. But what they're also saying is that they're unable to give. They're not able to share, uh, to give to others in time when others may need their help. And that could be the most horrific thing possible. And that is the uh, certainly in the view of the Mishnah, the crime of the, the people of Saddam and Amora and the other cities. The fourth reading tells us that God uh, brought rain and sulfur on the city of Sodom and it was uprooted and destroyed. Lot's wife does not listen to the instruction not to look back and she does look back 
and she turns into a pillar of salt. Lot and his daughters escape to the mountains, uh, and his daughters are under the impression that they are the last remaining people on this earth, uh, and they get their father intoxicated, and they become pregnant through their father. Um, one, of the, one of them would have the son Moab, and the other one would have a son Amon, uh, or Ben Ami, and they are the, uh, the ancestors of two very famous nations, the Moabites and the uh, Ammonites, who would, uh, who would bother the Jewish people in future times, and they would be neighboring uh, to the land of Israel. The Torah tells us a similar story to what happened last week, that Abraham and Sarah travel to Gerar, and they encounter the king Avimelech, and again Abraham says to Sarah uh, to say that she's his sister, uh, and again she's taken and God appears to a dream to Avimelech to tell him that he better return Sarah because uh, she's Abraham's wife, uh, and otherwise he will get punished. He does return her, and he gives him he gives Abraham some gifts. Uh, Sarah finally becomes pregnant and has a child, uh, and they circumcise him at eight days old, and he's named Isaac Yitzchak. Now, the commentaries point out that the story of, Ab- of Sarah having a child is placed right next to the story of them being released uh, from Avimelech. The reason why the two stories are put together is because if you read it closely, it says that uh, when Abraham, when Sarah was released back to Abraham, the, the women in Avimelech's household were able to have children again. Uh, and right after that, the next story is that Sarah herself has a child. And Rashi points out in the name of the commentaries that this teaches us the lesson that when you pray for a friend, uh, you yourself will get answered in the issues that you have. And because Abraham and Sarah had prayed for Avimelech and his family, uh, that they should also be able to have children that led directly to Sarah then being able to have children. And this is a powerful lesson about the idea of being able to put others before we put ourselves. The fifth reading tells us that Isaac grows up and Sarah notices that his older half-brother Ishmael seems to be a negative influence on him. And Sarah insists that Ishmael and his mother Hagar uh, get sent out of Abraham's home. Although Abraham initially resists, uh, God instructs Abraham to listen to his wife Sarah, which by the way is a Perhaps another lesson about listening to our wives. Um, and Hagar and Ishmael are given some water and they're off to their journey in the desert. At some point they run out of water and Ish- uh, Hagar is, believes that her son Ishmael will die uh, and she doesn't want to wash it, so she puts him under a tree and steps away. An angel comes to Hagar and tells her that um, she will in fact uh, survive this ordeal and her son will get better. Uh, and miraculously she finds some water uh, and he drinks the water and he starts to feel better and um, Ishmael grows up to be uh, a man who lives in the desert and becomes a skilled archer and eventually gets married. Um, There's an interesting idea here that says that the angels, the Midrash teaches that the angels told God if Ishmael, who's going to be the ancestor of uh, some of the Arab nations who will in future times, uh, specifically during the times of destruction of the temple, as the Talmud tells us, will uh, harass and hurt the Jewish people. Instead of saving him now, why don't you just, why don't you let him die? Why don't you let him expire in the desert? And that way, his ancestors will not be able to hurt the Jewish people. Uh, and God tells them, Bahasher Husham, that I only judge based on where the person is at the moment. And so we should always realize that regardless of what will happen in the future, uh, or perhaps what happened in the past, if we've had uh, regrets, we should realize that God will only judge us and only gives to us uh, based on where we are right now. And so there's no need to worry. Uh, about what we're going to look like in the future. As long as we keep doing the right thing, God will judge us based on how we're doing at the moment. The sixth reading tells us that Avimelech, who was the king previously who took Sarah, uh, wants to make a deal with Abraham that their children and grandchildren will be on good terms with each other. Abraham agrees, but he wants to make uh, some reconciliation with some wells uh, that Abraham had dug, and apparently Avimelech's servants had claimed to be theirs. Avimelech agrees to that, and Abraham sets aside a few animals as a as a peace treaty, a peace agreement. And then finally, the Torah says that Abraham planted a Eshel in Be'er Sheva, and he proclaimed there in the name of God. The word Eshel is uh, up to various interpretations. Some understand it as a tree, some understand it as a hotel. Uh, and, but the question is why the Torah puts that phrase in the same, why the, those two things in the same verse? Why does the Torah say that he both planted an Eshel, set up a hotel or a tree, and called to God, called to, in God's name? And the commentaries point out that those two things are together is because Abraham did that simultaneously. He set up a hotel and that in turn allowed him to uh, be able to inspire people while they were sitting and eating and drinking. He would talk to them about God and that would help them 
uh, be inspired and uh, continue their relationship with God. The seventh and final reading tells us a well-known but challenging story about the test that Abraham had regarding the sacrifice of Isaac. Um, the story, the way the Torah tells it, is that Abraham is instructed to bring his son Isaac up on a mountain and offer him as a sacrifice to God. Abraham takes Isaac, they go on that journey, um, and as Abraham is tying Isaac up onto the altar and he lifts up the knife and God calls out, or an angel calls out to, God, to Abraham and says not to do that, uh, and Abraham wants to do something instead, and suddenly he sees a ram uh, stuck by, by its horns in the thicket, and he takes it out and he slaughters that as an offering to God. Uh, then the Torah tells us that Abraham's informed of his sister-in-law having children. One of them is Betuel. Uh, Betuel then has a daughter, Rifko, who would in uh, next week's Torah portion, or the, the one after that, become uh, Isaac's wife uh, and the mother of his children. Why Abraham has tests is a question that many scholars and commentators discuss, uh, but one commentator points out the following, that people, uh, a craftsmen or people who build uh, various different things don't test their weakest ones, they test their strongest ones. If they know that if they bang too hard on the ones that are weak, they're gonna crack apart. And so God only tests the strongest ones, the ones that he know can really can knows can really uh, survive and thrive through that. Uh, and that's why someone like Abraham, who was an incredibly devout Jew, has a variety of tests, uh, and according to some counts, it was about 10 tests. Uh, and that's because Abraham was so strong in his faith and his connection to God that God was confident uh, that if anybody would be able to pull it off, it would be the strongest of the Jews, the strongest of his people, uh, and that is Abraham. However, we always ask God not to provide us with any extra tests. Uh, and so I wish all of you a Shabbat Shalom and a wonderful rest of your week full of peace uh, and relaxation. L'chaim. <laughs>